Hi, I'm Jen. I'm a product lead at The Knot, which is um, a wedding on a, a wedding platform uh, where we bring couples and vendors and their guests all together. So today, um, I'm here to talk about making good decisions. And what I've realized is, you know, I think most product people have some sort of weird path about how they got into product. And I'm one of those. I started as an account manager, was like in digital media, and kind of found my way into being interested um, into building products when I was at a startup. And so often, you know, people are like, hey, will you talk to my friend who's trying to get into product, try to help them get into it. And I realized that I kept saying the same things about you have to be good at making decisions. And so then I also realized like that's like one of my superpowers is decision making. And so I've kind of been interested in like why I'm so good at decision making and what that kind of means and kind of digging into some of the frameworks around it and how that makes you successful as a product person. So that's why I'm here um, today. So yeah, I want to talk about kind of a decision making framework. Um, I obviously didn't make this up, and so we'll talk a little bit about um, Bezos, who is a great person that you can always go to to think about how to make good decisions. Um, and then we'll talk about user science and decision making. And so actually, one of my partners here um, is uh, the head of user research at The Knot. And so kind of how we partner together with our user science methodologies to make good decisions um, in kind of a quick and fast-paced environment. So we'll do a little case study and then just some key takeaways. But if people have questions, raise your hand. This can be um, a conversation. All right, so just to start out, how many decisions does the average person make a day? Does anyone know this? It's like an ungodly number. Does anyone have a guess? More than 100. Oh, yes. 35,000 decisions are made a day, right? And so if you treated all those decisions the same, or spent a lot of effort making all of them, like you would go crazy. So it's really important to value different decisions differently. So let's talk about making good decisions. So there's sort of the basics, right? Of like, you need the right amount of information and you need to be able to make a decision quickly. Like, if there's anything that you just wanna take away from this, um, there's different levels of information that you need for different decisions, and typically making decisions faster than slower is better, okay? But that's, that's a little bit simplistic, so let's just dig into this a bit. What does it mean to have the right amount of information? So, talking about type 1 and type 2, not diabetes, um, but no, like this was an inspiration <laughs> from um, Bezos' 2016 um, letter to shareholders, but, but basically like he makes it simplistic into saying there's two types of decisions, right? The first one is not reversible, be very careful making, like that's a bold statement, right? And the second one is the decisions are like walking through a door, like you can always like walk back the other way and like everything will be fine. And, and while like it's helpful to kind of sometimes think about things in black and white, they're actually like a little bit more nuanced than that, right? I think anyone in product knows that. And so I found this um, decision-making framework quite helpful. So you kind of have like at the top, of course, like resources, investment of resources, right? So um, this is the way to evaluate like how much information do you need to even make the decision? How many resources do you have to invest? A lot, a little, you know, how can you kind of evaluate um, what, what the effort is? At the knot, we always say like, what's the effort of this? And I kind of see that as this. And then we have, what's the impact of this? So the first one is, what's the positive impact of this? Is this an incremental um, positive gain? Or is it like the company will actually change in a positive way if we're able to pull this off? And then you have your negative outcomes. And, and those are, you know, the, I like the way these four are bucketed, but there's a, do, a lot of different ways you can talk about negative outcomes. But like your brand and company reputation, um, existing or future customers, code systems, your data, or you know, legal or liabilities, right? So if we start to think about this framework, you know, what are what are what are things that are low on all the dimensions of of the import of the important scale? Like can you guys think of things in your daily jobs that's like you're really low on all of these? The color of a button. Yes. That's a great one. Copy most flows, you know, just different things that in the day to day you actually have to make decisions and figure things out and give people direction. But, but for the most part, they're literally low on, on every part of this scale. And, and so when you think about gathering the right information for these decisions, um, that, that will be something that you'll consider. 
So then if we think about, what, if, what about changing a company logo? Where would that be on these different places of the spectrum? Like investment of, of resources, like where would you think that would be? Probably like medium-ish, you know, there's a lot of, do you, do you agree? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of like design, product, PR, marketing, there's a lot of people involved thinking about this, probably a lot of user research involved, so that's like a medium. Impact of a positive outcome, like if you're actually able to change your brand or your image, like that could be really good for your company. Um, but then when you go to the negative outcomes, you know, your brand or company reputation, that, that's a higher risk of, of something actually like hurting your company. Um, th there's also a risk of it alienating future or existing customers. And, and so this is an interesting one where then when you kind of evaluate the importance of this decision, it's, it's actually a lot higher. Um, it's kind of in the scale of like, okay, you might need some more information um, to really make this decision. An innovation project. So at The Knot, um, we help people pull off their perfect wedding, and that can mean a lot of things. And so we often talk about what does that mean for virtual reality or augmented reality? What if you could put things in your venue, you know, like tables and buffets and your DJ and move them around and decorate, and wouldn't that help you plan and be amazing? And so when I think about a project like that on, on this, you know, investment resources, high, right? Like that would be a lot of effort for us to do. Um, impact of a positive outcome, like, yeah, I think it would be positive for our company. Like, would it like change our business dramatically and forever? Like, I don't know, could be cool. Um, and then when you think of negatives, like I, I don't think there's a big negative to the brand and the company, it would probably only help. Um, existing and future customers, I, I think that would like be actually more positive. Code-based systems data, that could get tricky. Um, and, and liability and risk. So this is also a way to think about, um, again, this is all around how important of a decision is this. And, and yes, you still need to do the right things, but maybe it's actually not this huge, ginormous decision that maybe it appears. And so that's how we kind of get into like, um, how much information do you need and then how much time do you spend making the decision? It's kind of like your confidence. So assessing the confidence level of like the way that you think about um, how important this decision is, right? So if you decide you're, if you kind of evaluate, let's say like launching a new email track and you say, yeah, like it's relatively um, a, a low impact decision and, and also I'm about 60% confident that everything I thought was going to be true then, then, you're, then when you define a confidence threshold, you're like, yeah, that's fine. Like, if, if we fuck this up, like, we can just stop doing it or there's not going to be a big impact. But in the example, like, changing your logo or changing your brand, um, for example, like, Airbnb, and they launched their new logo. You know, there was a lot of, like, what is, is this genitalia? What, what is going on here? I'm very confused. Um, am I associating the wrong thing with this brand? And so... I don't think they'd want their confidence interval at a 60%, right? You would want it to be, you want to feel more confident about um, the information that you're gathering and, and that you need to gather to feel good about this decision. So the more important decision, the higher confidence you require and thus the more information that you need. But what does this mean for making a decision quickly? So less important decisions, um, require less information, right? And so based on the amount of information one should seek is, all, is also on a scale of important or not important to very important, right? So the, least, the less important, after you've identified how important of a decision this actually is, then you can say like, here's actually the time I should spend making this decision. And I feel like the interesting thing about this is actually it's not about making the right decision all the time. It's actually about spending the right amount of time on, on few decisions that are wildly important. And so if you're actually just making decisions quickly, most of the time you're doing your job. And, and then at the pivotal moments where you need to actually spend the time to make the decisions is really like where you'll succeed or fail. And then you always have the 80-20 rule with, with information gathering. So here it's like you can actually get the information you need um, from 80% of the gathering, right? And so when you think about the information that you might need to make a decision, 
you know, there's things like data about past user behavior, previous research, learnings, previous things the company's done that are the same or similar, information that's publicly available, success or failures. You know, so for example here, like what if Facebook wanted to get into like letting people buy and sell on Facebook, right? And, and they wanted to understand what information they would need. You know, do they explicitly know if users want to do that on Facebook? Maybe not, but Craigslist exists, so to some degree, like there's a market. Um, there's Facebook groups, so maybe they can look into some of the behaviors there and, and see what people are doing or not doing. And, and so just to illustrate that like, even if you don't have this critical data point um, that you think is like the crux of, of making the decision, that actually like most of the information you have will, will make you feel good about the decision that you could make. And then this just goes into the speed necessary relative importance, right? So appropriate time to make the decision instantly or very long and not important to very important. And so this is really like an exponential curve, right? From, from not important to very important, like the amount of time is like almost the same. And then when you get to this point where you're actually making a decision that is very important, then, then it really goes up quite fast. So this is all great, right? Like, to me, like this resonates a lot more at a higher level. You know, there's a lot of bigger decisions that need to be made, but you know, if you look at it through this lens, like most decisions are very micro and like don't matter at all. Um, so like, what does that mean for our jobs? What does that mean for product development? So at the knot, we have this user science two by two, and I smile at my co-user researcher because she's always presenting this. Um, internally, externally, but, but basically what we're seeing here is that um, this is a great tool that we have to feel confident in these micro decisions, especially in the product development process where you're starting with a problem and wanting to get to something that is serving a user need, but how do you get there quickly and efficiently um, while making the best decisions? And so here, you know, depending on what you're trying to learn, you, you have qualitative and quantitative data at your disposal, right? You have things like interviews, customer feedback, beta groups, diary studies, usability testing. Um, and then quantitatively, you have survey, surveys, you have learnings from your search engine optimization, analytics, and A-B tests, right? And then on the left side, you have um, users' intent, right? Things that they tell you that they want to do, things that have, have happened that, believe, that may lead you to believe they would do something. Um, and then on the right side, you have like, what did they actually do, right? We, we know there's a gap that needs to be bridged here when, when we're actually determining um, what's right. So I thought the best way to talk through this, like more in the day-to-day -day product development phase, is just to talk about a case study. So um, just to set this up, um, this past quarter at the Knot, we had this deadline-driven um, launch that we were working toward. And we actually usually try not to do that. We're actually quite agile. Um, and quite um, you know, iterative in, in a lot of our product development. But this was like this huge marketing launch that we wanted to rally around. And so we had a very um, strict deadline. And we also um, had, had a small enough window where you know, it was kind of, we were aligned on a vision and, and a very key pro and a high level problem to solve. But you know, the way that we solved it at, at a more you know, product level, like was still kind of up in the air. So we really had to do this quite quickly and, and really like that making good decisions was the only way we could be successful, I would say. So this is just to kind of give you an overview of like what, what, we, what the problem was. Um, as a newly engaged couple, we want to communicate what we like to vendors because they can help make our unique vision a reality. And, and the reason I actually put this slide up here um, with our problem statement, our key hypotheses, and our guiding success metric is to also say this enabled the team to make quick decisions when we were actually aligned on the problem that we were trying to solve and what success meant. And so every time we got to a place where we felt like, oh, is this right, or what are we doing, or we could go this way, or we could go that way, we could just, this actually grounded us um, way more than you would expect. And so that, that was an important part of really just aligning the team. So our initial discovery. We had a bunch of hypotheses, right? And, and one of them was around, well, hey, if we can show users a bunch of images, they can tell us what they like or don't like, and we can help them think about their style. And, and the, the main takeaway here is actually that um, quizzes are, are not like this groundbreaking thing, right? We didn't make up quizzes. Um, BuzzFeed has a whole company on quizzes. People love quizzes. 
Uh, the Knot has some other quizzes, and they were quite performant, and, and we know the metrics on those. And so, yes, we wanted to learn a little bit about the UI, the UX, you know, kind of the way we should set up the questions that resonated with our users. We wanted to be a good experience, but really, we didn't need to like spend tons of time like, is the quiz the right thing? Like, when it felt like the right thing, like it was the right thing. Like, let's move forward and with with what we're doing next. And so that was kind of the most important thing that that we did here. And so then we started iterating on our concept, right? We're actually trying to help people build a vision so they can communicate with all the important people that are in their wedding, right? Um, now we're focusing on vendors, but that could also extend to like your wedding party, your family, maybe even your guests at some point. And so what we kind of um, fell on is it's kind of this concept that actually the quiz will end in creating this vision for you that then you can kind of start editing and making yours, right? So we can take our best guess at what we think your style is and things that we think will resonate with you, but really it's just the beginning of an experience. And, and this part was like a little bit harder, right? It um, has a lot of information architecture, UI, UX. Um, does the user understand? Does the user know they can edit this? You know, just kind of these simple things, but all of them together, we actually had a bunch of different problems with like having too many messages or, or, or not understanding um, what you could actually do. And so again, not to say that, that we spent too much time, but like let's get some concepts in front of people and, and figure out what resonates as quickly as possible. And, and so then we can just get this in front of live users, right? So up until this point, we were um, going on user research and interviews and prototypes, but really like we want to get this live to users. Like that's how we're going to learn the most. That's how we're going to quantitatively see, do people like this quiz? Do they finish this quiz? What do they do after this quiz? And, and so as fast as we could actually get to that um, what was really the goal. So then we had an alpha and a beta. And, and yeah, the point here is then not only were we able to get analytics in real time to see what people actually did, we were also able to um, get qualitative feedback. We had a survey at the end of it that said like, hey, this is new, tell us what you think. We wanna know if you love it or hate it or what else we could do. And this enabled us to actually nail the product for launch because now we had, and it was only a few weeks, but we had the ability to really say like, what's the most important things we could do that will be best for users that will serve our outcomes. And so this enabled us to really prioritize very fast based on what people were actually doing and actually telling us. And so that is why we had um, successful outcomes of, of this product on launch and it, it was a big success. Oh no, the S, <laughs> sad, um, key takeaways. So yeah, just to wrap this up, um, I think the most high level things about, about making good decisions are the importance of the decision is based on the effort and potential positive and negative impacts, right? Thinking about how important of a decision it is, and then the less important a decision, the less information you should try to seek to make it. Like you are actually doing your job if you're not spending too much time making every decision that comes across your plate. And then lastly, um, I think a secret weapon is to really utilize user science to make confident decisions faster in the product development process. Does anyone have any questions? Sure, comments. I'd love to hear a little more about the um, two by two matrix you guys use and just in terms of like getting to the point where you put the best replicate the user environment, but with minimal effort, time, resources, et cetera. Like, can you speak to that a little bit? Because obviously one-on-one -on -one interviews take a lot more effort and time than yeah, I would actually love for my um, coworker to answer this, but no, I mean, I think it really depends what you're trying to learn and what you're trying to do. Um, we are also lucky at The Knot that we have a user research team, we have a lot of users, we have a lot of easy ways to, to reach out to customers, but you're definitely right that different things take different amounts of time. Um, is there something like specific that you were trying to do? Do you want to add? Yeah, I think one of the things that really saved us time, like Jen was talking about how we didn't need to spend a lot of time validating that a quiz was something users would probably like. So after we got past that point and started iterating on the vision, we did moderated testing, which obviously takes a lot longer. But the signals that we got from that gave us the confidence to then iterate and move forward and do a bunch of prototype testing on something like usertesting.com. How about the point of, to get to the decision to go into the quiz, like add to the, the feature? Yeah, so with that, I mean, 
I think there's sort of a balance between, you know, I've been at The Knot for three years now. I've worked in a bunch of different departments in The Knot um, or, or on a bunch of different products. And so to some degree, I'm always balancing like intuition versus learning more, right? And so based on everything that I've done in the past, that I know about couples, that I just know about consumers in general, it seemed like our good first step. Should we have learned something that wildly changed that? It would have changed everything, but it's like, hey, let's like try the most obvious thing first here, and, and if it succeeds, great. Go ahead. It just, it just may be worth calling out that we do discovery on an ongoing basis, yeah. so a lot of the discovery foundation was already laid before this, for this project to kick off. Well, I guess like, I'm, I'm thinking about the time investment involved. Like, what am I going to spend by going forward with a quiz? From the moment you were like, quiz, until the validation of quiz as the technique. I'm curious about that duration. So, I mean, basically we, had a few different ideas that we were floating around internally and then to users. And so of all the things that we believed we could do quickly and act quickly upon, it was the quiz. So we we're kind of like, hey, we think this is a good idea. There's a, different, a few different formats it could take. So that was, I think, the part that took the longest. Like, based on what you answered, we could show you different things. Or like, should it be like this ever-evolving thing versus question by question? Like, so it's just kind of settling on some of the logistics of it was like more of the meat of the of the conversation versus quiz versus not quiz. And then what we actually wanted to do was then get the quiz live as soon as possible with just a shit output. Like not, I mean, I'm like being facetious, like it wasn't complete shit. It was just, you know, had a few words that you were, it like showed you some vendor recommendations, like maybe gave you a photo or two, but like we didn't, we really just like slapped it up there to see, number one, do people get through the quiz? Did we get good feedback on the quiz live and quantitatively? And then we could continue to iterate on the output. And so, so then we could, act, then we actually learned some things about the quiz while we were doing concepting on the vision, like the nicer vision product. And so, then we could get the quiz into a good place where then when it was all live together, we could really just focus for about two weeks on, um, on the heaviest hitting things around the vision. Uh, the biggest things on the vision ended up being around um, actually the vendor recommendations at the bottom. And so we, the, our, our biggest goal was to really like help you figure out your vision so you can share it with vendors. And, and so making those vendor recommendations um, seem relevant. We, we have like an algorithm and that's like another team, but even just making them seem personalized with the text around them. At the top, we kind of anchor to say like vendor recommendations at the bottom. So just some things around optimizing for vendor recommendations um, is what is what we really focused on, as well as like a few usability things about like you can edit some of the things. And so there was like a few problems with like completion of the editing and such. And the, just in terms of the length of the test, like what, I'm curious of like the success criteria for completing it. Is that like when a full picture of the wedding can be communicated to a vendor with the output from the quiz? So that was not the test. Um, the test was higher level about like what are your problems and, and how are we solving them. And so we would start them all, you know, around just talking about pain points. You know, we we targeted people in different stages of their planning process, but but no one. Well, actually, we did both. People that hadn't found their venue yet, so they were still in this like, oh God, what do I do? And there's so much up here. And then people that had actually gone through the process, so they could kind of be reflective about what it would have been helpful um, if they would have done it. And so then what we were able to do is just kind of talk about pain points. And, and as we sort of heard some of these pain points that, so we could just continue to validate the pain points, right? We already thought they were validated and then we continue to hear them. And then as they would come up in conversations, we would say, actually, hey, can you take a look at this? Um, you know, what, what do you see here? And, and what, would, what would this help with? And just very high level, but then have them explore it and talk aloud is how we just learned, like, do they understand what this is? Do they see value in this? What would they do with this? Um, like. We actually didn't have vendor recommendations on it to begin with to see if like did people's minds go there to say like I wish I could share this with a vendor um, or my mom or you know these different people and so that was the way that we kind of learned about it. It wasn't as much like time to completion, more like uh, validation of like this concept is resonating. Led to the discovery of that problem, like where you're like oh we need to solve it and we need to like, think kind of outside the box. Yeah. So. 
We had this large initiative this year um, that was like, we want to be the ultimate wedding planner. And The Knot has a lot of tools, like we have a guest list manager, and you can make a wedding website, and we have a checklist and a budgeter, and you know the tools range in, in different levels of, of helpfulness, I, would, I will acknowledge. Um, but what we really notice is that we don't help you kick off the process, you know, and we definitely don't do it in a fun way, right? And so when we kind of put on our wear a, wear a wedding planner hats, it's like how would a wedding planner actually start talking to you when you came in and said, I just got engaged. And so we thought that style was a great way to start thinking about your wedding planning journey and who you are as a couple and what you care about. I think to, to Chris's point earlier, we, we have a lot of good user research. Um, one thing that we did last year was this bride diary study where we stayed with 10 brides for a year long and followed them throughout their journeys. Um, and, and really, like, I mean, we have, what, like 15 product people at The Knot who are all, like, focused on different, on different problems. But again, a lot of times we hear the same pain points over and over, and so they're, they're very validated at a high level. Um, and then the other, the other place where we realized, and, and also just based on our data, we knew we weren't getting people as early as we wanted to based on like if they had a venue or not or when they got engaged. And so we were like, oh, we need to get people earlier. Like we need to be a part of this exciting part of right after you know you get engaged. And then we also realized that we don't really help you to the end of your journey. You know, we, we want to help you with a lot of the tactics in the middle, like finding your vendors and creating your guest list and sending out invitations. But like, what about your wedding day? Like, what are we doing for you then? And so then another team built what we call like the wedding day timeline. And so basically based on all the things that you're doing on the knot over the course of your planning, then we're in the background building this timeline for you where on we actually like output and you, and you can edit it and answer questions and stuff like how you what you should tell your vendors to do the day of like when your bridesmaid should arrive, when you should arrive, when the flowers should arrive, when your first dance is to kind of like orient your day. And so that was kind of like, how do we bring all our products together, right? How do we help you start your journey and then help you end your journey? So the thing I love so much about working at The Knot, like, I mean, I'm not a wedding freak. <laughs> I, uh, people were like, oh my God, are you obsessed with weddings? And it's like, no, I, I like to solve user problems. But really at The Knot, like we have such great product market fit that we have tools who most people have never even planned an event, right? Like it's actually very overwhelming to be planning your wedding. And you know, we, we look at even like buying a house for the first time or like renting an apartment or searching it for a job. Some of these things you're like, I'm not actually trying to get good at doing this thing, but like it's overwhelming and it's hard and I need someone to help me walk through it. And then on the other side, like you need vendors for your wedding. You need, um, another way that we make money is registry. Like you need to tell people the things that you want or don't want. And so these monetization oppor opportunities that we have like have such synergy with what our products need. And if we can help everyone um, come together in this ecosystem to really like plan weddings that they are excited about and feel good about and be less stressed and pull them off in the ways that they want to, like it's kind of awesome. What about removed of the mat? What do you love about being a product manager? Um, I love... Um, I just love solving user problems, right? It's, it's nice to come in every day and sometimes at the highest level we're like, what is our strategy? What are we doing this year differently? What's most important to serve our customers, beat our competitors, um, bring the sides of our marketplace together? And then on the lowest level, like, we talk to users. Sure. So as a, as a PM, prioritizing user stories is always a challenge. So since you were talking about decision making, could you give a couple of examples of how you prioritize certain stories and then what went behind the thought process? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing is like impact and effort, right? So what, what do we, exp and like at EXO, we have this very like outcomes over outputs. And so, okay, I, it's like, I wouldn't be like, oh yeah, we launched a style quiz. It's like, no, we launched a style quiz that did X, Y, Z. Um, this is our outcome, right? We helped X number of couples figure out their style and X number of couples share it with vendors. Like, that's what we did. We didn't just like create a style quiz. And so I think when we think about story prioritization, it's like, what are the, what is the outcome we would expect? And we can look at the different outcomes and understand like which have the most impact. Um, and then from an effort perspective, there's, there's a, bit, a lot of balancing around like, this is a hard thing to do. Do we take it on now? How do we take iterative steps so that we feel like it still is the right thing as we continue to go through it? Um, you know, like, there, 
I mean, I'm lucky to have amazing technical partners that really understand, like, this is a time when we should take on tech debt. This is a time when we shouldn't. You know, this is about to get mission critical if we don't fix it. This other thing, like, let's do it loose and cheap and figure it out. And then if it actually works, like, we can figure out how to make it stronger and better. And so I think it's just, I mean, effort and impact are, like, at the highest level, but, like, really relying on your partners. Same with my design partners. It's like, yeah, I mean, we could fix a million things about the UI and the UX that drive you crazy, but, like, let's really talk about the ones that are most impactful and that we, we feel like mean something to users or actually, like, make our site look um, like shit or, like, untrustworthy or, or, you know, something like that. Earlier you, you were talking a lot about, you know, like, effort as a ratio to risk. And have you, have you found that the, the greatest problems lie in those situations where you, as a product person, see a inexpensive opportunity and miscalculate the risk of doing so? And I think, like, brand is probably one of the greatest areas where product will probably mess this up or don't consider brand risk. So it could be something as simple as like um, reorienting just some fields that are on a form on your, your app. Um, but by doing, it's cheap, right? You can move anything you want. It's super, super easy. And you view it in your mind as like, I'm just going to A-B test that and let's see what happens without taking into account how stupid that might make you look by presenting that new layout to a subset of users that are in those groups. And now they think you are a bunch of idiots that don't know what you're doing. You find, like, is that the, the category where you see a lot of uh, problems when it comes to applying the right uh, amount of decision making when it's cheap? Yeah, I mean, I think it's also, so I used to be um, like very deeply in, in the local part of our business. And so, I'm sorry, I'm sorry let, me, let me explain. So like we have a marketplace where we connect couples and vendors, right? And so you can search and there's pages and you can contact these vendors and such. And that, that's like one unit of our, of our business, right? There's product people on that. I used to be a product person on that. Now I'm a product person um, kind of more at the top of our funnel around like how do we create a great planning experience so that you want to find vendors, so that you want to do these other things on our platform. So when I worked um, in, in the local unit, uh, things were way more sensitive. The, the level of risk was higher to do something that could potentially have an impact on vendors. For example, we have this button on the storefronts that used to say send a message and now it says request a quote and that like tripled the conversion. Um, but then we also had the impact of like vendors feeling commoditized. And so there, there is, a, I do believe there are certain parts of our business and certain products that can be worked on that just overall are more sensitive to your business or to your brand. And that there's other places where you're like, hey, like we should really be able to do and not something stupid, right? But take more risks here or not take a ton of time making this decision because we can reverse it, we can learn quickly, we can learn easily, we can only show it to 5% of the audience. Like we have all these tools at our disposal where we should just be learning. And, and honestly, I think the biggest um, thing that we weren't doing last year that we should be doing this year is we're doing a lot of, or I, I guess just, at the knot as a whole. There's been a lot of iterating, right? Like let's make an iterative change here and there. And, and really at the knot right now, we need to like take bigger swings, right? We need to say like, this is actually a hard thing that we've been talking about for a long time. And, and yes, of course there's risks associated and the decision-making process is, is more difficult, but that actually like we're only gonna make a step change, you know, in our business, in the market, if, if we do this. And so I think like the pendulum kind of swings, right? Where you're like risk averse and then not risk averse. And so how can we make ourselves feel more comfortable about the decisions that we're making, or at least like the steps forward toward those decisions?